Welcome to this week's edition of Code Pink's What the F is Going On in Latin America. This is uh, 20 minutes of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean every Wednesday, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time and 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Today, we are going to talk about El Salvador and the um, extraordinary attempted coup on Sunday uh, in, in El Salvador's National Assembly led by um, the Salvadoran president. We are joined today by Yesenia Portillo from the Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador. And she is the East Coast Regional Organizer with CISPIS. So that's Committee in Solidarity with People of El Salvador, C-I-S-P-E-S dot org. Encourage you to go to their website and their Facebook page for additional um, information on our conversation this afternoon. So Yesenia, let's just hop right into this extraordinary event that happened Sunday. And um, can you give us a little bit of background leading up to the president's um, decision to call an extraordinary um, session of the National Assembly and give us a little background to that and then what happened. Yeah, so I think I would say um, attempted coup is is like a little bit unclear at this point, but definitely an insinuation, as we were saying a little bit earlier that um, he he definitely was um, flexing his his power um, and showing that if he wanted to, I mean, it's what he what he's basically been claiming that if he wanted to, he could um, carry something carry out on carry out a full coup. At this point, you know, things are have you know kind of settled. We're not sure what he's planning on doing next necessarily, but um, he definitely, it was definitely an abuse of power um, and it was definitely uh, an attempt to pressure the legislative assembly um, to, uh, to, to approve a, a loan that he's requesting for his um, public security plan. Um, so it was also definitely a violation of uh, a constitutional violation of the separation um, of powers um, under the constitution, you know, the legislative assembly had, there's a full on process of, you know, how um, an executive um, requests a loan um, to be approved by the legislative assembly. Um, and it doesn't include um, going on Twitter and demanding that the legislative assembly press a button as he has, as he has said. And it's not the first time that he's done this. Um, this is the second, uh, loan for public secure for his public security plan that he has um, strong tried to kind of strong arm and um, pub at the nat you know he he goes on on national media or on his Twitter um, and try and claims that you know the legislative assembly needs to approve and kind of tries to act like he can force them to approve um, uh, these loans without really informing the public about what the actual process is, what's mandated by the constitution and what's mandated by the country's laws in order for a loan, like of loans of these nature to be approved. Um, so um, basically that's, that's uh, what kind of culminated, uh, what, happen what happened in the background um, is that um, uh, he is requesting a second, uh, over a hundred million dollar loan. Um, the first loan that he requested it was ninety million dollars um, for his public security plan, and that one is also being discussed in the legislative assembly. So both loans are in the appropriate time frame and the appropriate, you know, um, process of of being discussed by the appropriate commissions in the legislative assembly. And then once the first commission approves or like negotiates and debates it goes to like the full body to be approved and once the legislative assembly approves it then it goes back to the executive and the executive has to take it back to the lender you know and come to new terms with the lender according to what the legislative body agreed to and then it goes through a second round of um, debate review, um, depending on whether or not, you know, the, what the Legislative Assembly is looking at is, you know, 
what are the terms of the loan and what are what's the money going to be used for um and there's different phases so even after they he gets this first approval it has to go back for a second round of approval after negotiating with the banks so he kind of makes it seem he 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 has um uh, invisibilized that whole prop process to the population and is making it seem as though the legislators are they're bad and they don't want to fix the crime problem and that the, because they've all according to him and according to the media have they've all negotiated with the gangs um then they um are are not wanting to approve these loans because they don't want to find a solution so let's take a minute and talk about um the president's security plan and why it's necessary or why he deems it's necessary. And also just to let um, our viewers know on Sunday when this exec when this extraordinary session of the National Assembly was called, there was no quorum. I believe about 22 of 84 of the members showed up and the president walked in with the military and police as a demonstration of power and uh, and a and perhaps implying that he has the military forces behind him, although we don't know if that's a full commitment by the military or not, but that was the message he was intending. Yeah, so right, I think, I believe the um, extraordinary session that his ministers called, uh, you know, the council of ministers called, um, which it, under the constitution, it, it's also not a legitimate um, request. Um, the Council of Ministers can only call for an extraordinary session of this nature if it comes to matters of um, national security and ur like urgent national security. So um, uh, natural disaster or war. Um, so approving a loan is not, you know, <laughs> uh, an extraordinary circumstance under which a ca the Council of Ministers can call for an extraordinary session. Um, I believe it was Saturday um, that they that the date that the that the session was called. And so because because they didn't have a quorum on Sunday, he called for an insurrection. Um, and so that's, I mean, on Saturday, he called for an insurrection and asked people to gather at 3 p.m. on Sunday outside of the Legislative Assembly. So when the legislators didn't, when, a, you know, a quorum of legislators didn't show up um, on Saturday, I believe, um, <clears throat> he removed their security personnel. Um, so he left the legislative representatives, the legislative deputies without their security detail, and then militarized um, the legislative assembly and called for his followers to uh, called for an insurrection and called for his followers to come to um, the legislative assembly at 3 p.m. on Sunday. Um, so there was a, a pretty substantiated fear on the part of a lot of the legislators that they were going to be potentially taken by force um, um, to participate in these, you know, extraordinary sessions, perhaps. Um, it was, it was, there was a lot of fear, I guess, about that, because why, why take away their security detail? And there were reports that um, the police were showing up to some of the legislators' homes or their families' homes and asking about their whereabouts. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and, and then also, as far as there was also a lot of reports that he was um, that state employees were being pressured to attend this rally that he called for. He also used um, state buses to bus people into this rally that he held at 3 p.m. And so what happened on Sunday is that he held he held a you know he did a presentation in front of those the folks who came out and whether by pressure or by their own will whatever the case may be at his supposed insurrection um and um you know he gave a speech and then asked them in this it was all very performative you know so he gave a speech and then he asked them for permission to enter the legislative assembly hall um, and so then he, so he entered the public. Yes, basically rallying public opinion, so to speak. So to speak. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, and he said at, it, he, he said, was looking for public legitimacy. Yeah, it's oh, like yeah. I said, it was all very performative. Mm -hmm. um, so he said, can I go in and like, what are the people going to say, chant and rally? Um, as if that is enough permission to go into the Legislative Assembly Hall full of, you know, he militarized, he had already militarized the whole perimeter. He had snipers, they had snipers on type on top of buildings and then entered um, with armed military into the hall of the legislative assembly and then prayed he asked you know he did ask the public can i go in to to, to, to say a prayer so he went in there and prayed that the legislative um, assembly would approve this loan wow praying with surrounded by the military correct yeah so on monday i think it was monday the um assembly president mario ponce uh in a press statement said quote we cannot respond to the executive branch with a gun to our head unquote mm -hmm. which is pretty much what happened to the mm -hmm. assembly members you it's like you you do this or or what when you mm -hmm. see them with the military and the police um, in the assembly. So Yesenia, let's talk a little bit about what the president's um, security plan is mm -hmm. and um, what his vision is and why he's implementing this plan because this is the plan that he's um, requesting the loans for. And where did he apply at the, the Central American Bank for Economic Integration, I believe is the financial institution. Yeah, so um, as I was saying earlier, this is um, the second loan that is that he's requested and that's currently in in debate and negotiations in the Legislative Assembly. Nothing, nothing is necessarily out of the normal. However, um, with this second loan, there is a lack of transparency and a lack of really justification of why the money is needed. Um, there's like, you know, there's a lot of different things here, but um, <clears throat> one of the things that is being denounced by the social movements is that um, this, the, that this, this portion of the security, or just his security plan in general, has been kind of mashed together without any consultation by um, civil society. So that's one thing. Um, but this, this, the second hundred um, hundred and nine million dollar loan. There's the the only thing that the public really has seen about what he wants to do with this money um, has come in the form of a tweet um, that has we, been posted. We're used to seeing presidents operate via Twitter, right? Yeah, so it's we're a familiar with that in this country as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's unclear what the legislative assembly has, but it but but it is. But what has been kind of announced is that there's not enough information, that there's kind of, they don't have enough information about the exact details of how this money is going to be used. But what the public has seen is, um, a, the, you know, the only official document that the public has seen has come in the form of, the t of a tweet from the Treasury Department. And um, that is like a series of illustrations and graphics um that basically say that they're going to be purchasing you know thousands of surveillance cameras um about a hundred drones facial a facial recognition system and the setup of 13 monitoring systems um, and fiber optic um technology um so yeah that it's it's to beef up surveillance tech basically um and so yeah, I mean, I I think there's um, it's questionable whether or not there is mass support for this kind of surveillance in communities as a way to address um, the security issue in El Salvador. Um, and then you know, just another thing to be aware of is that um, these kinds of you know the punitive solutions and you know militarization because the first the first phase of his um territorial security plan has supposedly already been well it was in part implemented there was a beef up of um military and police into um the communities um and then the second phase was 
that was also supposedly implemented, although he is waiting on a loan for part of that for the second phase, um, is uh, has to do with um, op opportunities for youth. Um, and then this third plan is, you know, the third phase is beefing up the security um, systems, the surveillance systems. Um, so, so yeah, the the I think the biggest chunk and the most tangible chunk of what he's put forth, because even the second phase that's supposed to be about opportunities, if that is also available online and it's very superficial. There's not a whole lot of detail uh, about, you know, research that might have gone into what are the best ways to prevent um, uh, you, you get a particularly youth involvement because because what the way in which um, the security and violence situation is imagined by these solutions is that it's all like youth in underserved communities that are committing the crime so then they become the targets of punitive surveillance measures um, when in reality, that's not the case. This is a larger systemic issue. And there is evidence that there are, you know, narco trafficking, um, you know, uh, organizations and functioning in El Salvador, and they are not the targets of these security measures. The people that are the targets of security measures end up being marginalized communities and youth that have lack of access to opportunities. And so that's what the social movements are speaking out about. Yeah, and absolutely. Let me, there's two things you said with the narco trafficking, and I believe that's how the president is framing the need for this security policy is to combat narco trafficking and gang violence, which could be people of all ages, probably principally youth. But also a lot of what you're describing to me and correct me if I'm wrong, or perhaps elaborate on this, has to do with, you're looking at basically militarizing communities down to the neighborhood level with the financing of this particular uh, um, military equipment and targeting putting young people back to work. Are we looking at this being a form of controlling migration from Salvador? Oh, yeah. And so let's talk a little bit about that, that this is about keeping people in place. Oh yes, and absolutely. Preventing, and preventing migration <clears throat> absolutely. So, out of the country. Yeah, I think um, there is not holistic, a holistic view of people's right to remain in their homelands and like what, what is necessary in order for that to happen. What, because obviously what needs to happen is people's environments need to stop being destroyed by transnational extractivist industries, obviously, um, and uh, mass inequality that comes from um, <clears throat> uh, prioritizing for-profit interests, transnational for-profit interests in local communities is also obviously one of a, a, a very much a, the, an issue. but. Um, yes, I think you bring up a really important point in that we can't forget that um, since Nayib Bukele has come to office, he has been um, subservient to the Trump administration's demands at, my, at uh, migrant containment. And this, this is something, this demand at migrant containment is not new to the Trump administration. Um, it was happening also under Obama and the previous administration was also receiving the same kinds of pressures. I mean, I think it's the pressures are exacerbated now, um, but um, you know, the previous administration had a much more, the previous administration in Salvador had a much more um, humanitarian view of migration and um, their response was always that migration is a human right and that they were implementing as many, uh, you know, they were, they were doing their best to address the root causes, the economic causes of displacement. Um, and we're and, talking about the previous Salvadoran administration. Correct, right. And so this administration, Nayib Bukele, is, um, in contrast, has been extremely subservient to the Trump administration and has... Um, 
militarized its borders, you know, before before this administration, El Salvador did not have um, a border patrol. Um, migration is, uh, you know, open um, amongst the C4 countries, which is, you know, Nicaragua, Guatemala, and Honduras, and El Salvador. Um, and they have been uh, receive, you know, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador now have been receiving extraordinary amounts of pressure from um, ISDHS, the Trump administration, to militarize their borders, um, which is against their own international and national laws, which say that people can migrate, migrate freely amongst that region, uh, around that region. And so um, recently, El Salvador established a border patrol, which did not exist before, and um, yeah, has been criminalizing um, out migration, um, including um, including forcibly stopping caravans that have tried to exit El Salvador, um, arresting folks who are organizing caravans, um, calling them human traffickers. Um, so yes, this is, we, I think these things cannot be separated from the asylum agreements that have been um, entered into with the Trump administration and the ultimate goal of containing migrants so the containment of migrants so that is halting the outflow of people or the freedom to to leave if they feel they need or want to um so we've talked about that and you also mentioned um you know the existence and influence of transnational corporations in salvador or actually throughout throughout the hemisphere in central america specifically are we looking at corporations forcing a population to remain um, in order to provide affordable labor? Or what do you see as the, the principal reason? Yeah, possibly. I mean, I think the, uh, the, the containment has more to do at this point with the Trump administration and the U.S. government, even the pre the previous government, um, the previous U.S. government's um, outward push of its southern border, um, and just the the making of Mesoamerica as the the border and um, uh, of of the U.S. Um, and so it's containing migrants from reaching um, the U.S. southern border. Um, yeah, I mean, and I think, you know, when when Nayib Bukele first was elected president before he was before he was his term started, but but after he was elected, the first speech that he gave was at the Heritage Foundation, um, the right wing think tank here in Washington, D.C. And um, he told that group of, you know, xenophobic right wingers, extreme right wingers, um, that he would end all migration from El Salvador um, and that El Salvador was open for business. Um, and it and it is his whole his whole shtick has been that um, he's going to bring in um, more transnational business and that he's going to therefore um, create more jobs. It's also been coupled with threats to the eight hour workday, for example. Um, and so he, it's, it's very clear that this is all, um, you know, neoliberalism at play. And like, it's already- So much like what, um, what um, Pepe Lobo said um, right after the coup in Honduras. Mm -hmm. Honduras is open mm -hmm. for business. It sounds mm -hmm. very, very similar, the rhetoric. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So we know, we know what it means. I mean, this is, this is the other thing is that in El Salvador for a long time now, um, the U.S. has played a really significant role. I mean, throughout the region in terms of providing responses to the insecurity and violence there. So we have it, you know, through the drug war policies, through um, the Central American uh, Regional Security Initiative, and then the Alliance for Prosperity. The US has been 
um, spending hundreds of millions of dollars in the region in um, creating supposed responses and, and yeah, just uh, uh, shaping that reality, shaping the reality in El Salvador. So training the police in El Salvador, training and giving mil military security funds to these countries where time and again in El Salvador, there's a lot of reports of extrajudicial killings by the police um, that have been trained by the US. And so, I mean, this is under the FMLN, um, let alone what, you know, um, under a government that's, you know, open, spreading out the red carpet to transnational, usually extractivist industries. So we know what happens when you throw military and security funding to um, people like Juan Orlando in Honduras. Um, that military and security funding is used to suppress dissent. Um, it's used to, yeah, it's used to protect the interests of capital. Um, and, and again, in El Salvador, we already know that there's, there's already been exposés of extrajudicial killings by police trained in the United States. And so throwing more money at that same system is um, very dangerous. So, so we're looking at exacerbating the existing, existing system versus trying to find a systemic solution. Mm -hmm. And we can say that through, throughout the Americas, I think. So we have a few minutes left and I so thank you for the extended conversation um, this afternoon. Can we talk a little bit about what you see unfolding um, the rest of this week in El Salvador on the heels of the president's um, action Sunday afternoon? Yeah, um, so uh, yesterday evening, no, on Monday evening, um, there was a manifestation called by the feminist block of El Salvador um, and they took to the center to um, rally and protest against um, the Salvadoran, you know, by the president's um, excessive use of military force. Um, and today there was also a manifestation at the National University. Um, yesterday I saw videos of um, the university being heavily militarized. Um, so it'll be, I'll have to see what ended up happening at today's um, rally at the university. Um, the social movements are calling on the attorney general and the Supreme Court to investigate um, the legal, well, you know, the, the crimes that have been committed by, um, by the president. Um, and, and yeah, I think the assembly is currently discussing the loan. Um, and uh, I think it certainly, it certainly was a, well, an intent to pressure to get that money, uh, but it also was um, uh, an intent to deflect um, public attention away from um, <clears throat> criticisms and investigations that are being brought against his administration. Um, so previously, um, in the weeks prior, um, the Minister of Health and the President of the Water, the National Water Administrative Body, um, were called into hearings by the Legislative Assembly. So you had the Legislative Assembly calling on representatives of the executive to come and explain themselves as to why um, brown dirty water was coming out of um, their faucets in, in um, the, the nation's capital. Um, Is that and water system public or privatized in El Salvador? Now it's, in the it's currently public. There are, um, there, you know, in 2007, this is a whole nother conversation, yeah, but it is mostly public, but there is a huge, you know, it's a contentious what? issue right now. Um, the water mat, the water, um, treatment, um, is open to privatization and in part privatized, but the management, uh, otherwise is currently public um, <clears throat> and it's inefficient in a lot of ways because of the lack of funding and resources that has you know 
been provided to that system by the elite. Um, and so, so yeah, I mean, they, the executive was being called into question for their, their response to the crisis, to the water crisis. Um, and they had refused to attend the hearings that um, the legislative body had called them into. Um, and the legislators were getting ready to um, take the next steps, you know, the steps necessary to um, uh, force them to, um, to comply um, with their requests for for a hearing and for an explanation about what was what's going on, um, and so that's something that um, they were that the administration was dealing with in the weeks prior. Um, there's also there's other things there's other things <laughs> that he's you know trying to deflect from. Right. Basically, he's, he's has an executive that's basically pushing for um, the expansion of, of neoliberal capitalism and privatization. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So that that is an entire another conversation for you for us to have. And I welcome you back for that. But I will also say in closing um, our conversation, this inevitably every um, webinar we have done on Latin America since we started having these conversations. Inevitably, our, uh, the discussion comes down to the expansion, the forced expansion of neoliberal capitalism throughout the hemisphere. And, um, and this is yet another example of what's, of what's happening. And so I so appreciate you making time for us this afternoon. And it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And I just want to remind um, our, our viewers that Yesenia, Yesenia is from CISPIS, Committee in Solidarity with People of El Salvador, and the website is cispes.org. I encourage you to go to the website. There's, there's a great blog posted um, on Sunday's events in El Salvador, and, uh, and visit their Facebook page as well, which is, uh, I think it's just CISPIS on, on Facebook. Oh, it's CISPIS Solidarity, I believe. So. <laughs> so, and then, um, so yes, and we will definitely have you back. We need a broader conversation on the extraction industry and, and, and another one on migration as well, Yesenia. So, um, so we'll have you back. And thank you, everyone. I just want to remind you that we air this webinar every Wednesday, 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. And also to let all of you know, tomorrow on Code Pink Radio, 11 a.m. Eastern, we're going to have an hour-long conversation on the U.S.'s unilateral use of financial sanctions as a form of economic warfare. And you'll be able to listen to that on WBAI out of New York City or WPFW here in Washington, DC. And we'll see you um, on what the F is going on in Latin America. Oh yeah, please. Uh, can I just, I, uh, the, so our Facebook is um, CISPES, C-I-S-P-E-S, -E Solidarity with El Salvador. Um, that's our national CSPES page. We also have chapters um, in different cities in Los Angeles and DC, um, in Boston, in New York, and Seattle, and San Francisco. And so those um, local chapters also have their own kind of social media pages. Um, but yeah, our national page is CSPES Solidarity with El Salvador. And that's our Facebook. And our um, website is cspes.org. Um, and I believe that our um, our Instagram is CSPES underscore solidarity. Okay, terrific. And I'm going to share with you the, the archive video from today's conversation as well. Great. Okay. All right. Thank Thanks you. again. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, everyone. See you next week. Bye-bye.